record this. All right, we're going to get rolling. Uh, we're, if you guys haven't been here, you haven't been here before. <laughs> um, the way we do the EOK meetings, uh, and I heard uh, Terry kind of talking about it a little bit, just give everybody a little bit of background, anybody that's new out there uh, listening. Entrepreneurs in Knoxville started back in 2008. It was a group of guys that were hanging out at Camaro once a week. There were eight of us at the beginning, and I arrogantly labeled us the entrepreneurs of Knoxville and thought we were just a bunch of smart guys that knew everything about everything. And each week, one person would be in the hot seat and that person had the floor. So you could say, I'm thinking about a new startup, I'm having problems with marketing, I'm having problems with a client, whatever. And everyone there would help you. And it was, it was great because all of these people had experiences that were a little different than yours. And they could tell you, speaking from their experience, this is, I've been in that situation before and this is what I did to correct it, fix it, you know, move forward, whatever. As I listened to all of my peers talk around that table, I thought, man, this is a great, a great thing. I mean, the, the information that's being exchanged here is priceless. What if we set up a little website and we post these articles, these tidbits of knowledge as podcasts and as blogs? So I, I set up a little website, started posting them as blogs. Twitter and Facebook had just kind of started coming on the scene at that time, kind of a little heavier. And I said, well, let's experiment with the social media stuff. And we'll talk on social media <clears throat> about what's going on inside of the OK. That made us even more popular. And people, we started getting traffic to the website. And I was like, well, this is great. A couple of the members couldn't make meetings. They were traveling. And they asked me, could you record the audio? so that I could catch up. I don't want to miss what's happening at the meeting. Still, this is just the same group of guys. So I started recording the audio for members that weren't there. Then I was trying to figure out a way to publish it, put it online so it was easy for them to listen to. And I was like, hey, why don't I just put it as a podcast and I'll just put it in iTunes and they can just subscribe to it. And the still, this is just for us eight people sitting around the table. Um, People started subscribing to the podcast that we didn't know. People uh, started showing up to our meeting because they saw information on the website. Jack Lell was following us on Twitter and said, uh, hey, can I send Carly over to interview you about this thing, EOK, that you're doing? I said, yeah, cool with me. The newspaper article runs, and the next meeting we have at Panera, there's 20 people standing around us saying, hey, we're here for the entrepreneurial meeting. We were like, what, on, what do you mean? You know, this, is, this is like our thing, you know, who are you people? And then the next time there was like 30 and then 40. People were just pulling up seats, like just crowded around listening. And then it was so hard to listen that we had a couple of members then saying, I can't hear anything, you know, it's too noisy in here. Could we go somewhere else? So I had a vacancy in my building down in Sequoia. And I said, well, let's just move down there. So we moved down there and started meeting. And the whole space would be just packed with people. Karen was there in those early days. JP was there in those early days. Uh, Andy, were you there whenever we were meeting down there? Then it was like people would be, it's a three room little space. It's like a thousand, uh, 900 square feet. It was just packed. I mean like people wall to wall inside the space. The guest speaker would be here because we started doing guest speakers then and we'd put a camera on them to record what they were saying and how they looked and everything. You would hear people asking questions, you couldn't see them, they were in other rooms, yeah. you know, or they poked their head around, hey, I just wondered about this, you know, so it was really kind of cool. Days. And then we moved to another space because we had a, somebody volunteer to lend us their space. And then we started thinking, maybe we got to do something with this. You know, it's getting more and more popular, it's helping lots of people, everybody thinks that it's really cool. So we put together a little board and started talking about what we can do to actually give it some more structure. And we're still looking for structure today. Um, I think some of that's my leadership is not great about structure. Great visionary. I love like imagining things. It's whenever it comes to those little details that I'm like, man, somebody else needs to take care of that. This is not my gig. Um, 
So we've gone through several iterations of what EOK is. EOK is always about that uh, peer relationship, the, the crowdsourcing of your information. So we value every entrepreneur and think that all of us bring something special to the table, that no one else has the exact experiences that you do. And you bring so much to the conversation when someone's saying, here's my business, you know, even if it's like uh, a software startup and your company is landscaping, you still bring something to the table to say, you know, this is how I got customers. And if you're gonna be talking to consumers about buying this thing, here's some things you ought to think about saying. So it's really cool all of the feedback that you get from the individual members. Something we started a few years ago, which I was surprised that it kind of went away, was the, was the peer groups. And Andy was a real champion of that because that's how EOK really started. I mean, it was a peer group, a bunch of people sitting around the table helping each other. And Andy and Beth and, were you involved with peer groups? I Who, uh, Karen? I mean, yeah. Said, hey, let's get these peer groups started up again. So they kind of came up with some rules about, around it because EOK really only had one rule. It was, you know, be cool, don't solicit sales from one another. You know, come in here, this is a safe zone, we're all equals in here. Don't look at each other as customers. We're here to help each other. Um, the peer groups came up with this thing of saying it needs to be confidential. It needs to be exclusive. We shouldn't have like three landscape people in one peer group. There should only be one landscape person in a peer group. Um, you should have to participate. You should only speak from experience. You can't speak from opinion or I think this or I don't think that's a good idea. You know, how do you, what do you base that on? It needs to be from something from experience. You've actually been there, done that. So we're gonna get those cranked back up. And since peer groups never really caught on the way they should have, I'm gonna try something new of just forcing everyone to be in a peer group. And say, so, okay, here's the 187 registered members. U8, 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 and then just go down the list and put everybody into a peer group, uh, kind of the way I think they should be. And you, know, you guys can go from there if you want to. Um, and then we're gonna do weekly, I mean monthly meetings now instead of weekly. Weekly was just killing me and the board members and less and less people were showing up. So I was thinking, well, there's no value to the members in it. And why are we knocking ourselves out to do it? We'll do a monthly meeting, we'll do the peer groups, and then we'll wait for the membership to tell us if there's something else they need, you know, and we'll be here to serve them. So, do I? We're keeping pub night. There's something about us and drinking that, you know, goes together for some reason. <laughs> and most of my stories start like that. You know, I was having a beer with a couple of guys, and we... That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I mean, all of my startups are like that, you know. I was having a beer with this guy, we were talking about this problem, and a new business was born. I talked to a couple of entrepreneurs this morning that were wanting to rent a space from, or actually buy a building from me, and just started rattling off all of this information, and they were like, man, this is just incredible. And I, and I was telling them, this is what happens at EOK. You know, you just learn from other people's experiences. And then I met with, right after that, I had another meeting with a group of UT students that are working on a project and thinking about a startup. And they told me their idea, and I was like, dude, you, you four need to drop out of school right now. I mean, this is the thing right here, you know. I can take you to Angel Capital Group, you know, this week and get you funded. This is incredible. And they're all excited. And I, was, I gave them a few more ideas. Then I said, something you need to do immediately is go get a confidentiality agreement, a non-disclosure agreement and an assignment of rights agreement. And you should have me sign all three of them first <laughs> because you're taking a risk by allowing me to improve your product and your idea. Um, I, I know that I seem like a nice guy, and I am a nice guy. I wouldn't take the, the, the idea. But someone with resources could. You, know, you need to be careful about that kind of stuff. So anyway, back to this. We're doing lunch meetings now, which I think will be helpful to a lot of people because you get to eat. You get to hang out, you get to network, and we're gonna do, uh, still do the spotlight, the member spotlight, where somebody gets to come up here and talk about them a little bit so that we all know who they are, what they do, and how we can leverage them or work together you know, uh, to improve all of our businesses. Um, we're also gonna continue to do the educational components, uh, which is a big portion of the EOK. So today we have Kate Kaiser is coming to talk to us today and she has a presentation up. 
And I'm going to turn it over to Kay, and she's going to tell us all about what she does. Come on up, Kay. Yay! And this pusher should work. Okay. All right. Here goes nothing. Um, I want to talk to you, and let me talk a little bit about sort of the concept of this presentation. I was watching a TED Talk with a presenter, and I believe his last name is Sinek. It's S Simon. Simon. And he gave this wonderful TED Talk about a golden circle. And sort of, to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to really understand the why of what you're doing. It's not so much about the how, it's not so much even about what, it's about the why you're doing what you're doing. So today I want to talk about the why, my why, so you all know my why, and how my why relates to EOK. So let's talk about my why. And first I want to start with entrepreneurs. Did I already cause a problem? <laughs> Did I already break it? We went backwards. Okay. There we go. Entrepreneurs. <laughs> so, an entrepreneur, a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. A lot of the why I do what I do has to do with trying to minimize the risk associated with being a business owner, especially being a startup when you there are a lot of pitfalls, and that's also part of why I come to EOK. You don't know what you don't know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can be a brilliant person, but you don't know everything, and being able to accept that and get help from the resources that are available, I think, is really important to your success. So, what do all entrepreneurs have in common? <laughs> ideas. All entrepreneurs have ideas that they bring to the table. Those ideas fuel innovation. Those ideas fuel dreams. Being able to see an entrepreneur take something from concept forward is an amazing thing, and I really believe in that. I believe it's what makes us great as people, our ability to take concepts and grow them. Entrepreneurs fuel everything new that comes out. Every, every great product that you love came from someone's entrepreneurial spirit. Entrepreneurs also fuel our accomplishments. Other entrepreneurs develop the tools that you need to do the things that you want to do. And all entrepreneurs reach for success. That success, though, does not come without support. You need help. Anyone who thinks that they're a total DIY, that you can do everything yourself, I will root for you, but good luck with that. I need help, you need help, we all need help. And if you're here in this room, it's because you realize that on some level, that you need the support of your peers. So that is a lot of my why. Um, to give you a little bit about my background, probably like it seems like a million years ago, a lifetime, I started another business and it was a bakery. And I was really good at baking and I think that I had a lot of talent as a cake decorator and I did wedding cakes and was doing all this and had a day job but was doing this on the side and got started getting tons of referral business and it was getting to the point where I had two or three weddings every weekend and then I didn't have a personal life anymore. It was all my day job and then this other job that I was doing. So I decided well, I'm going to quit my day job and I'm going to start this business and I got some capital together and I got retail space and I was gung-ho and I'm going to do it and I ran that business for a year and sold it because after the end of that year I had enough. It was like I can't do this. It was too hard. It was too stressful. There was too much to do, too much to be involved with and I alone could not manage production and inventory and bookkeeping and payroll and everything that was required of me as a business owner. So I sold that business and then I decided, I contracted with another company for a year and then I got a job with another company as a payroll processor. And they did outsource payroll for other companies. I worked for that company for five years. I started entry level there as a payroll processor and sort of at the end of my tenure there, I was their executive director of operations. Um, that, that opportunity ended for me, the company went away and I was left thinking, what am I gonna do? So I had 
what I felt like was a real passion to help people. I believe in outsourcing. I think it can be a great benefit to a lot of people. And I had that experience and that knowledge, so I decided that I would go off on my own, and that is when I launched my company, Viridian Payroll and HR. So I've talked to you about the why I do what I do, and now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the how. So as we get into the how, doing business is a privilege. Having clients is a privilege. There are a lot of times when I think you get into business, and I remember at a point in my bakery feeling like if another customer walks in the door, I'm just gonna scream. I don't have time to talk to anybody. It became really hard. So that's one of the core things that I believe. Doing business is a privilege. I believe in honoring our community. EOK is Entrepreneurs of Knoxville. I believe in local business, in supporting each other, and in using local companies when at all possible. And like we do in EOK, being able to pool and share resources to help each other and teach each other and help foster success in our community. Um, without integrity, nothing we do has value. You can make all the money in the world with a business, and if you're doing it without integrity, it will catch up to you at some point. So without having integrity in your work product and the services that you're offering, there's no value to what you're doing. Do it right the first time every time. Not cutting corners. If you commit to a client and tell them that you're gonna give them something, being able to deliver that product, deliver it on time, and I think there are a lot of times I think as entrepreneurs, you all get into a role where you're just so busy and inundated, you're like, well, if I cut this corner, I can come back, I can fix it later. Really don't believe in that. Leave doing it right the first time. Care. You really need to care about your clients. And sometimes that's hard, but you do. And for me, it is because that's a big part of my why. I care about the success of other entrepreneurs. I really want to see that growth. I also believe in caring about the people that get you there, and that means caring about your employees, being a responsible employer, caring about them, doing HR the right way, not just as risk management, but being able to, if you have an employee that you're thinking about terminating, have you given them the opportunity to improve? Have you told them what they're doing wrong? Have you offered them assistance and improvement? When people come to work for you, you want to inspire their loyalty. And by caring about them and doing everything you can, I think you can accomplish that. And that'll also help you realize your dreams. And there's a better way. No matter what you're doing, no matter what I'm doing, there's a better way. I don't know how many times I've been sitting around doing something and pulling my hair out and thought, there's a better way to do this. This is such a headache. There's a better way. And that's something I take to heart. I think it's important. And another thing of being a part of a group like EOK is being able to learn from other people. You need to be open to constructive criticism, not just from your peers, but from your clients. If a client complains about something, you can't brush it off and just say, oh, they're just grumbling about this. You really need to look at, is there a reason for that and how you can improve. Um, I try to embrace a process of sort of constant improvement and always evaluating our practices. Is there a better way, a more efficient way, a smarter way, or a way to deliver better products or services to our client base? So that's the how, and this is the what. This is what I do. Viridian Payroll HR. What we offer people, um, payroll, payroll tax filing, W-2s, 1099s. We have a really fantastic software platform. It gives 24-7 access to administrators and to employees. Employees can go on. You can do your entire employee review process online. Um, we also can help you with PPACA reporting, aka Obamacare. If clients are worried about that or they're like, what am I supposed to do? What do I need to do? We can help you with that. And also EEOC reporting, um, Equal Employment Opportunity. You have to report if you have employees. We also help with human resources. A lot of times people that I know, and I hope you all feel like you can do that. If you have a general question, if you're not my client, it's fine. You can call me and say, Kate, I need to fire somebody or something's gone awry. Can you help me with that? Most of the time I can answer your question then and there. If I cannot, I have an arsenal of resources and HR professionals that I network with that I use to help me. Um, HR a lot of times is gray. It's not black and white. It's an interpretation of the law and you know how clear like laws are when they're written out. <laughs> so I go to those resources a lot if I feel like there's any ambiguity in what's happening or need to bounce that off, but that's something I can definitely help you with. 
um, FLSA compliance, Fair Labor Standard Act, Standard Act, being able to correctly calculate your overtime, um, who's exempt, who's not exempt, what do you need to do to make sure that you're paying people legally. Performance tracking, online reviews, time and attendance. We also offer time clock services if you um, need something like that. Um, new hire reporting, if you don't know this, anytime you hire somebody, you need to report that to the state. It's part of, part of being an employer. And then um, things too that our system will do, job costing, labor allocation, a lot of sophisticated accounting tools that are built into our software to sort of help clients manage their business as a whole, as a whole picture. We can also help people by offering pay-as-you-go workers' compensation, which is nice for their cash flow, um, helping with unemployment claims and protecting your suitor rate. We also can withhold and remit your child support and garnishments, handle those things if you have employees that bring that sort of stuff with them when you hire them. We can also manage PTO, vacation and sick time, and benefits. Um, I could go on for probably hours about every little thing that we do, but this is sort of in a nutshell what we do for our clients. So that is my why, how, and what for what I do for people. So does anybody have questions? Mm -hmm. uh, are you brokering payroll services or is it managed directly through proprietary software of yours? It's, well, it's not proprietary software. The software company that I use, mm -hmm. the software is HR Pyramid and that's owned by a company out of Boston called right. F.W. Davison. Um, anyone who knows PEO or payroll, it's my opinion, HR Pyramid's the premier software. The only real companies that are going to have their own proprietary software are going to be your big national ADP competitors, your ADP paychecks. Yeah. Okay. So anybody else who's offering payroll services, they're running off a platform. Right. Okay. Does anybody have anything else? Any questions? When did you start? I just launched in July. Okay. Yeah, so it's brand new. That's awesome. Shiny little penny, pick me up. <laughs> so yeah, it's a brand new company, and um, I live here in Knoxville. I actually, well, I don't live in Knoxville. I work in Knoxville. I live in Maryville, and I've lived in Maryville since I was five. I love Maryville. It's my hometown, and um, really, really love the community there. It's a great story. We keep hearing some young entrepreneurs who started that way, right? You had in an industry and it sort of ended and just go, oh, I'm just going to do it for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like, you What's your target market? Um, target, really, I, people who are ideal, and when I think of ideal, I think who can I help the most? Really, like who's the most in need of what I do for people? Restaurants. Most people that start a restaurant, they're like, I'm a great cook, I'm good at entertaining, I can put together a fantastic menu, create an atmosphere for people. Restaurants, perfect people for us. Two, they have a lot of high turnover, a lot of times there's issues with management, and they have, I think, a lot of employer liability, especially when you are looking at someone who's a restaurant. If you have a restaurant person, I'll give you guys a little payroll lesson. If you have restaurant employees, so let's say we've got Susie, and Susie works as a server, and when she's a server, I pay her $2.35. But two days a week, she's a shift supervisor, and I'm paying her $10 an hour. And then sometimes if somebody calls in, she might have to work expo, and that's $7.25 an hour, or I'm going to put her on the hostess stand for $8 an hour. Our system, we can program it to where, like if you're on a 40 hour week, all of those pay types have a different pay rate associated with them. To remain FLSA compliant, you have to do one of two things. You either have to pay your employee over time at the appropriate rate for when they sort of breached the overtime threshold. But to do that, you have to be accurately time tracking and know what shift they were working when they hit overtime. And your employees have to sign a waiver up front that they know that you're paying them that way. Or what I think is the preferred method, you have to pay them a blended overtime rate. So you have to take all those wages and all the hours and all the declared tips and divide that out to get a premium pay rate for overtime. So if you're trying to calculate that on your own as a restaurateur, you're probably pulling your hair out or you're doing it wrong and let's hope your employee doesn't go to the DOL because then you're going to have real issues. But our software can do those things automatically. We can program those FLSA rules. You go in and key the hours and the various. The system will recognize, oh, they've got over 40 hours. Let me apply a blended overtime formula to that and pay them appropriately. 
So they're a good candidate for us. Other people that are good candidates for us, um, service industry, like construction, um, construction companies that maybe have, because you have a lot of construction companies that are work from home companies. I'm a contractor, I maybe have like 10 employees that I come with me, things ebb and flow. They, I think, enter into a lot of risk by getting confused about who's an employee and who's an independent contractor, which can be problematic for them. But also a lot of times when I talk to people, they may be excellent at what service they're selling, but they don't have a flip, you know, they don't have a clue about payroll or how to pay people properly or how to handle things properly from an HR perspective. So those kind of clients are ideal. What about something like the, we started this intern program and making interns available to EOK members and to all and also with my Rotary Club making them available to other Rotarians, that some of the interns are very interested in just working for free. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we'll work for free, we just need the experience, we want to put it on our resume, um, and they're working 20, 25 hours a week for free. Mm -hmm. um, I've wondered about that, like, is that illegal to have them, you know, generate, providing a value? This is sort of the rule of thumb with unpaid interns. If you have an unpaid intern, they can come to your company, they can observe, they can partake in meetings, but if interns themselves are actually producing any type of work product, you need to be paying them. That's sort of a keep it safe. So it's great to learn, and I've worked with interns before, but you really have to be careful about what they're doing and what they're participating in, if they're unpaid. Mm -hmm. Or you can pay them minimum wage and work them like slave labor. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we do. You know, the ones that I'm using, I just decided, I mean, they're, they're pretty valuable so far. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they brought some value to the table. But I, I wasn't even sure what minimum wage was right now. 725. Okay. So, 725 is the one of them, I think we're paying both of them 10 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. No, that's good, that's good. But that is sort of the rule if you have an unpaid intern. If they're actually producing work product, then you need to be paying them. If they're unpaid, it's really like a purely observation experience for them. Where's Mr. Clark? It's kind of um, I'm a member of a BNI group, and it's fantastic. A lot of referrals from that, um, which is wonderful. And if you are an entrepreneur, you know, I would encourage you to join a networking group. It's good. Um, for me particularly, when I started off, I had a good network that I already had existing in place of PEO salespeople, payroll and PEO salespeople and brokers that I had from my previous occupation, so that's good. Um, but what I've found for me and sort of my model and what I want to do, I don't know if I'll ever really want to employ necessarily full-time dedicated sales staff. Mm -hmm. I really am a firm believer that if you are really offering a great product and service, that the referral business that can come from that, from word of mouth, is going to keep you busy. Because what's the first thing you do when you find something great? I mean, I'm chatty, so I tell everybody. I'm like, I found a great product. Everybody use it. I made my presentation in Prezi. Excellent. And it's fantastic software. I would encourage you to use it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a funny story and I probably shouldn't tell people I should make something else up but <laughs> I wanted a name that was distinct um, one of the things that I had seen a lot with the industry is there was a lot of the names all sounded the same to me and they all sounded sort of campy I wanted something that was easy to brand that would be easy to recognize and remember the name um, the logo I developed myself but the actual name Viridian, there was a TV show um, called Better Off Ted. Has anyone seen Better Off Ted? It was only on for like two seasons and it's a comedy show, but it's sort of about this guy who works for this major corporation and it's called Viridian Dynamics and their tagline is we do that and sort of part of the joke in the promos, anything you could think of, they were like, we do that. <laughs> so I was sitting around and most of you probably know this if you are an entrepreneur, when I was trying to come up with a name for the company, I spent an endless number of hours and I was looking at mythological figures and all these names and Latin derivatives of words and then I would go on to GoDaddy and search domains and what's available and what can I get and you know, I, I really wanted a .com, not a .net. 
So I kept searching for all these things and I couldn't find, it. like anything I found that I liked was not available. I couldn't get it, it was taken, or I could buy it for $30,000 because it was a good name. So I, on the off chance, I was watching that show one night on Netflix and I was like, Viridian, Viridian. And I searched it and it was available. So that's where the name comes from. <laughs> Actually, that's so, the last thing I blogged about, was what's in a business name? Uh -huh. Everything and nothing. Yeah, it is. It's everything and nothing. Uh -huh. So, and I think my a lot of people do that. If you're naming your business, and I didn't want it really to be anything with my last name. I didn't want it to be, you know, but I did. I was searching and I was looking at different languages. Oh, okay, what's truth in Latin? What's, you know what I mean? All these different things. And anything that I found that I liked wasn't available. And as you know from branding as an entrepreneur, you have to have a website, you have to have email addresses, you have to be able to successfully brand your product in your name. So it's probably not the greatest, like, oh, we're really inspired by how Kate came up with her company name, but I think a lot of us find ourselves in that situation. Thank you. <laughs> I think what I've learned, with, especially with URLs, is three words and you're usually okay. You get less than three words and it gets terribly difficult. Yeah. to get that URL. Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult. And Viridian Payroll and HR are actually two separate companies, but I wanted to be able to do a common brand mm -hmm. because really and truly there's, um, Viridian HR is a licensed PEO in the state of Tennessee and Viridian Payroll is just a payroll company. They have to, they have to be distinct in that way. But I didn't want to, at one point, another company that I worked for, we were one company, but we had all these sort of smaller companies that comprise the big company and as director of operations trying to set up our phone system so reception okay if it's this line you have to answer it this way if it's this line you answer it this way so we just answer the phone meridian and that works for us <laughs> right that's good sometimes those solutions are the best yes i'm always i believe there's a better way constantly sort of asking yourself is there a better way to do this to manage so thank you all for your time today thank you Thank you, Kate, very much. And as was mentioned earlier, there is a pub night this week. So today's meeting, pub night is tomorrow night at Calhoun's, I believe. It's on the website. So be sure to check out the website, eokhq.com. Follow us on Twitter at eoktown. I do want to thank our sponsors. I didn't thank any of our sponsors today. Pershing Yokeland Associates for providing the space that we're in. Check them out online at pyapc.com. Ludica Neely Group, online at lng-patton.com. Uh, Neighborhood Nerds at schnerd.com. Check those guys out for any of your residential or small business uh, technology support needs. And fairmechanics.com. If you have a car and you have a problem or a need, post it online. The area mechanics will bid on that job for you, save you time, money, and frustration. And Robbie Robinson, robinsoniplaw.com. Thanks. A lot of sponsors. <laughs> They're all great then. All right. Great job. Great job. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.